this technology is not my friend. This <laughs> you, know, you should have to be in charge of it. Okay. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I call to order the December 2023 meeting of the Special Committee on University Relations of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. Everyone, um, welcome again. Uh, thank you for being here at our third special committee meeting. Thank you to those joining in the West Committee room via and via Zoom. As a reminder, <laughs> I'd like to share that today's meeting is not being live streamed. Rather, the Zoom recording will be uploaded to the board's YouTube channel after the meeting for archiving. As a housekeeping reminder, I'd like to note that the West Committee room has room-wide microphones. These microphones allow for any speaker to be heard in the room, in the Zoom meeting, and on the recording. The audio feed will pick up all audio from the room, including conversations you might have. Given that, please try to limit any side conversations, which includes those around the table and members of the committee who are here with us today in the room. Additionally, regents and presenters, given that we will not use the room's touch speak microphones that are in front of you, please project when you speak so your remarks are clear on the official, for our official record. With that, let's move on to our first agenda item. Our first item is a presentation from Ms. Lopez Frenzen, the university's system-wide executive director of government and community relations. Good morning. Good morning with a discussion of the fall legislative higher education hearings. I'd like to welcome Ms. Lopez Frenzen to the presenter's table and interim president Enger, would you like to get us started? Uh, very much, uh, thank you so much, Chair Kau Rabe and Vice Chair Gully. Uh, the Minnesota legislative session formally begins on February 12th, mm. but we've already been very active this fall, hosting bonding tours on our Twin Cities and Morris campuses for the Minnesota Senate and House as well as a bonding tour for the Minnesota Management and Budget Group. Um, we appeared at the House Higher Ed Committee meeting on October the 30th, and indeed we're gratified that five of the regents were able to join us that day, and it was definitely noticed by the legislators. Uh, Julie Tonneson and I uh, supported Melissa's work there that day at the hearing, and our understanding is there probably will be another one before that February 12th kickoff. On November 21st, we introduced our 2024 state capital investment request to the governor's executive budget team. And of course, our University of Minnesota representatives continue to attend meetings of the governor's task force on academic health. The recommendations of that task force are due to the governor on January 15th, and those recommendations may also be part of the University of Minnesota's advocacy efforts once we know specifically what those are as we head into the session. For a broader report on the work from this fall, I will now turn this over to our Executive Director of Government and Community Relations, Melissa lopez Franson. Thank you, uh, Chair Tao Urabe and President Edinger for the opportunity to be with you this morning. And I am excited to share some of what we, uh, was already mentioned in more depth, but also excited that we are moving along in the process of resetting the table for government relations and building a team that will lead us this legislative session and beyond. So some of the opportunities that we've had, if we can go to the first slide, the second slide, please. As was mentioned, some of the events that we've done, this is by all means not a comprehensive list, but some of the highlights that we've had since our last meeting in this subcommittee. And I'd like to share that um, we have uh, a state relations team that is being built, and I'll get into that in, in a minute. The state relations team has been busy with advancing our Board of Regents approved University of Minnesota request of 500 million for more than 150 higher education asset preservation and replacement projects system-wide, which is HEPR. Uh, this fall, we've hosted a number of events with legislators and with the governor's staff to a total of nine bonding tours across the state, including on our campuses of Crookston, Duluth, Morris, Twin Cities campuses, and the West Central Research and Outreach Center, giving them an opportunity to experience our facilities in critical need of repair firsthand. During these tours, uh, students and faculty and staff have shared how HEPA funding will support education, research, and outreach and help legislators understand the statewide impact of these projects. These tours provide our team, team with valuable 
uh, feedback to help guide our legislative strategy, as well as help us identify effective and passionate advocates of the projects. We also hosted the Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget Office in the Twin Cities campus for a tour. And as was mentioned, uh, Interim President Jeff Edinger, Vice President Myron France, and Vice President Alice Roberts Davis, and myself presented to the Governor's Executive Budget Team on our capital request. I want to thank each and every one of the people who made these tours possible, from all the logistics to making presentations and leading tours. The list is extensive, so I'm not going to miss someone. It was truly a system-wide effort. Gavrell also supported various hearings at the Capitol. First, as was mentioned, the October 30th Minnesota House Higher Education Committee hearing, where the university leaders, including uh, IP um, Edinger, Budget Director Tonneson, and UMPD Chief McClark presented to legislators and elaborated our internal budget process. On November 13th, VP Bernard Golochat presented to the Legislative Commission on Cybersecurity, <coughs> where he discussed in an open session with legislators uh, the recent data breach we experienced this past summer. And finally, from November 10th to November 18th, five representatives from the University of Minnesota participated in the governor's state uh, trade mission to Australia. Vice President Shashank Priya, president of research, uh, or research and myself, were on the higher education track where we visited many universities and trade schools. From those relationships, uh, we are close to signing an MOU with Monash University and Melbourne uh, Nanofabrication Center, which is a leading place in the world for manufacturing and characterization of micro microelectronics, fluidics, and biosensing chips. If you need to know more, I'm sure Vice President Priya will share so much more of his report. Uh, we also started a partnership discussion with Australia Research Data Co Commons, which is an in charge of accelerating Australia's research and innovation by driving excellence in the creation, analysis, and retention of high-quality data sets. These type of partners, partnerships will align with the CHIPS and Science Act from our own federal government and where Minnesota and the University of Minnesota is actively engaged on and will serve as a catalyst to what was mentioned yesterday by Vice President Priya, his vision in, in 2030 to um, increase our rankings and our research uh, funding dollars. Other participants were Senior Vice President Myers France, who participated on the Met Tech track, and Dean Beverly Durgan from the Extension, and Allison Hahn from Naturally Minnesota, uh, formerly Grow North uh, Home Center for Entrepreneurship from the Carlson Schools, who were on the agricultural track. Their role specifically during the trade mission was to provide the research and extension connection between the Australian University and the University of Minnesota. And the role that these collaborations have made in international agriculture production and international trade. The Ag dele de Delegation visited four Australian universities and two of these universities already have collaborations with the University of Minnesota Research and Extension faculty. And there's great potential for increased collaboration. Uh, next slide. So our state relations timeline, as we remain on track with our, our goals, this update includes the exciting announcement of two additional members of our team, uh, from Christine Keel, who is here um, in presence in this subcommittee meeting, uh, who comes from uh, the medical school, but formerly from government relations, so she's back on the team, and she will be um, on track to do the portfolio of health sciences, given her experiences. So we're glad to welcome her to the team, or welcome her back to the team. And the remainder um, of the colleges and units will be shared between myself and our second uh, hire, Andrew Shelsetz, who just starts next week. We're also in the process of interviewing for a federal relations position, so stay tuned. GovRel is also working on finalizing the federal uh, FY 2025 appropriations process that is being coordinated with support from Lewis and Burke. And as you all have heard, this week the budget forecast for the state of Minnesota was announced and it presented a generally good economic outcome with a projected surplus of $2.4 billion at the end of the 2024-25 biennium, and then to $82 million at the end of 2026-27. We know that the legislature will be hard-pressed to make new or recurrent investments that will put the economic stability of our state in jeopardy. In light of that, we must equip all of our advocates, including our regents, 
and our senior leaders with a compelling story of why the University of Minnesota is a good return on our investment and can be a catalyst for economic development in times of uncertainty. No doubt our requests for core mission and academic health support will be meticulously scrutinized. In light of that, GovRel will serve as a resource to prepare all testifiers on behalf of the University of Minnesota and our regions that are willing to engage in advocacy on our behalf. To that end, please mark your calendars for the University of Minnesota Day at the Capitol, February 22nd. You will get more details as we get closer. And we're gonna keep you updated on opportunities to engage with legislators at the Capitol. Next slide, please. This is an example where the University of Minnesota just before we hopped on a plane to Australia, we hosted this event with the <clears throat> University of Minnesota leading it with the Chamber of Commerce and participants from Niren Magnetics and the Shakopee Midewakanton <laughs> Sioux community. And we extend this type of, or, of ex engagement with our local community. And this particular, you might have heard of Niren Magnetics, which spun out of the University of Minnesota Research Lab in 2013 and a space here in Minneapolis with just with about 60 employees. And this company is developing clean energy magnets, which can be made from iron nitrate, a common element seen more sustainable and less expensive than metals and used in standard permanent magnets. The Shakopee uh, Midewakanton Sioux community is also a, an investor in this company. So this event is a perfect example of the collaboration with local businesses and community by bringing leaders from across the state to support the university. Next slide. We also have hosted uh, events with our federal delegation here in our, in our campuses. Just recently, U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar brought the NSF director, and most recently, she came to visit the St. Paul, St. Paul campus with Senator uh, Debbie Stabenow, who's the Ag Chair, uh, Chair of the Agricultural Committee at the Senate federal level. And later today, we will be back in St. Paul campus with state legislators to, uh, with the showcasing the arrival of the 2023 National Turkeys, Liberty, and Bell. So as you may know, the University of Minnesota Department of Animal Science will serve as, as the forever home of these two um, turkeys in the Twin Cities campus just down the road in St. Paul. Next, and now we're going to go to the second item in the docket. Next slide, please. Unless you want to sure. take a break from there. Do we want to we can We can pause and, and take questions. Okay. Great. Why don't we just take a few minutes and see if there are any questions or comments from colleagues before we have you continue. Yeah. Any? Oh. Regent Gali. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, oh, I, I don't yeah, have to do that. Just project. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you for this presentation and for the work. And um, uh, I think these relationships that we build with other universities and um, places like Australia and other places are just incredibly important for the university. And um, I really appreciate, I know these delegations can be wonderful and also exhausting. And so I'm sure they kept you very busy the whole time and um, really appreciate the work that you all did building those relationships and partnerships in the university there. Interim President Enger. Well, I just wanted to, first of all, thank uh, Melissa for the tremendous work she's been doing. It's just, it's just such a load off Myron Franz. It's, it's, it's just <laughs> so appreciated by all of us that, that you've taken on this and you're doing so well with it. I also wanted to have take the opportunity to <clears throat> thank members of the regents here that um, I know that I guess East Cliff is typically kind of an entertaining venue for the university and, and indeed we would the legislators would be maybe potentially part of that with the governor and his family living there. That's, you know, we're not using that this year. And so it probably put a little bit of extra premium on uh, taking advantage of invitations to our football games. And, uh, you know, a lot of you, not only did Melissa make sure that we really had a bipartisan group of folks that received invitations, but a lot of you individually did that as well. And so those conversations and those opportunities were very valuable and very appreciated. Okay. Regent uh, yeah. <laughs> when you sit there, you forget everyone's yeah. name. <laughs> 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 name. When I'm chairing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, um, again, great work, and you know, you've just hit the ground running, and there's still so much to do in sessions coming up. 
Um, you know, I locked in support the U day on my yes. calendar, uh, 22nd, whatever it is. Okay, yeah, is it? <laughs> whatever it is, I put it in there. Uh, just on that note, um, and I'm sure, especially as you build out the team, you'll engage more with students. But I just wanted to know that students have always been a really key part of our legislative efforts. Um, James and I used to meet at the Capitol when I was at UMD and he was here in student government every sport the U day. We had Bulldog Lobby Day, interim chancellor, you know, knows about that. And uh, when the Duluth and St. Louis County Chamber would organize a lobby day, UMD would be there, student government would be there as well. Um, and, you know, um, and, and those student groups are really effective. I, I you know, if, if there, there's been years they're advancing agendas and bills that the administration is like, wait, you know, we didn't know about this party, but good stuff, right? I mean, there's a number of uh, legislation we can actually look back to and point back to student government. So I'm sure, as, you know, you put together the team, um, we'll find ways to collaborate with them and just take advantage of the great energy and, and organization that they have. Chair Uwab, I do want to respond too because I, I failed to mention two of a very pivotal, important testifiers at our October 30th hearing, which was Shashank Morali from uh, president of our uh, student government and also uh, Donna Spanis, who's representing faculty. So we had all voices there at the podium um, representing two legislators. And that's important. They just can't hear just from administration or, or staff. They need to hear from what I call real people, which is why we do this work is for our students and we have faculty uh, to support those students and staff, obviously. Uh, but I think that when they hear from students and the testimony that we heard then was talking about the needs for, for students, in, in, for instance, for basic needs like food security. Uh, so those are things that I know uh, our student services is working really hard to ensure that they students have what they need. Uh, we've also seen the support that the university has done in the past with, uh, or just recently, with the um, uh, housing issue and some of the apartments that might not be ready for, for move-in. And our student services, legal services, have been on the forefront to support our students so we have a lot that we've done that we like to showcase and we certainly want to be able to connect with uh, student organizations and student groups so they can also uh, be part of this strategy and for February 22nd uh, we would invite all and anyone who wants to be in maroon and gold at the Capitol so you'll see a big splash that that does turn heads when that happens at the Capitol thank you Thank you, Ms. Uh, Lopez, friends, and um, thank you for the presentation, too. And uh, I'll just echo everybody's thanks uh, for you really just hitting the ground and running. I mean, it's incredible to think about just what, you know, what a short amount of time you've been here and how much has already been accomplished and just um, how great that is to see again for the university, as you said, resetting the table and prioritizing our relationships with uh, the legislature, but also a, a lots of other stakeholders. So just thank you for doing that. And I'm also really glad to hear about the staffing up of the office. <laughs> um, that is really, really important. And we're excited to hear that you, you, you now have some support and more are coming. So um, and I think given the comments, probably appropriate for us to move on um, because we really want to discuss this next part, which is um, our second item uh, for discussion with Ms. Lopez uh, friends and is really on the board engagement for the 2024 legis legislative session. So floors. Thank you, floors. Chair <laughs> Chao Rabe. So next slide. So these, and this is a work in progress, so don't um, tie yourself necessarily to these slides, but certainly this is gonna be a partnership with not just the regions, but anyone who wants to go to the Capitol and support our request and support our message. Uh, we will do that uh, together and with a strategy, so we're uh, dividing and conquering, but also are aligned. So the first slide talks about our strategies at the state capitol, and this could also be replicated when we engage you to attend DC when we do have our, our space and our office and our, our representative there to deploy as well. But in, in key for, for this presentation is our state capitol. 
Uh, we certainly want to increase uh, the elected officials' understanding and support of the university, and that's what we'll deploy uh, some of our strategies for that. We'll connect advocates, like was mentioned before, students, faculty, staff, alumni. Um, need I not forget, alumni are a huge part of our of our strategy. And our stakeholders, whether they are in business, like we, we mentioned, uh, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce or other <coughs> nonprofits, the University of Minnesota has tentacles in every community in every part of the state. So we want to leverage their experiences so they can tell the stories of what it means to collaborate with us. And we're going to increase uh, our advocates and partnerships understanding and support uh, our legislative to support our legislative requests and other university priorities as they develop from uh, all parts of the university. We'll, we'll try to support them and align them with our overall strategy without diluting uh, the core mission work that we're looking to support with our funding requests. Uh, as well as how to be the best advocates. Uh, it could be a phone call. It could be uh, present at the Capitol. Nowadays, we have Zoom, so a lot of the testifiers can be on Zoom. And you don't have to. Um, this is, you can just sign up. Uh, but when you sign up uh, as a University of Minnesota representative, GovRel will be right behind you to support you, to prep you, uh, to help you with testimony, and to make sure that you have what you need from us to, uh, to align with our, our mission uh, support uh, strategy. And then support uh, faculty and staff compliance and self-mandated reporting. Uh, some of it is we do want to know who's at the Capitol because we have to track this. Uh, we have to track this information. We have mandated reportings, and we have someone in our staff that's dedicated to that and reaches out to the different colleges uh, to ensure that we have compliance at the state and federal level. Uh, next slide. So this is some of the other part that I just mentioned. This work is done in partnership, as I've said, and collaboration with students, faculty, uh, staff, alumni, and with all of you at Board of Regents. We have been having conversations on our one-on-one -on -one, uh, to how to best equip Regent advocates on the strategy and deployment for the next legislative session. And I have, as I've mentioned to all of you during our recent introductory meetings, GovWell will be supporting uh, you in the form of training if you need so need some uh, best practices before the legislative session opening day on February 12th. Uh, we have really good relationships with a lot of the legislators who have been there for a long time, but we also are building relationships with new legislators. And all of you have relationship with those legislators that you have invited to events of the U. Uh, we want to make sure that we're leveraging those relationships. It's easier to talk to someone that you know uh, and, and be able to talk about a, a, a difficult subject or perhaps um, uh, clarify information that they may hear in the media when you have those uh, relationships on your own. So we want to leverage them. This will be in the form of, uh, we'll also uh, prepare you for testimony before you appear in a committee or in a hearing or in an interview with media on our legislative priorities. So anything you, that happens at the Capitol, just think of government relations as your partner um, to bounce ideas, to help you align, to help you get information you need before you pick up the phone or before you're on, on a podium at, at the, the legislature. Um, some folks um, in some regions would like to do that. Some others are, are don't, but we'll find a way to activate you because we need all of your voices uh, this year and beyond. We'll aim to provide you with a strategy, talking points, like I mentioned, and the issues of the day, uh, because there's things that pop up in the legislature that they want information, they want the reaction from the from the University of Minnesota. Uh, so think of us as, as, as your one-stop shop, and we'll be able to triage that with you as we go through the legislative process. And part of the guidance uh, from GovRail is the expectation that there will be some level of coordination at the Capitol when meeting with elected officials in Minnesota and Washington, D.C. on behalf of the university. We will provide updates as we monitor legislative issues that affect the university and our interaction with legislators on pending legislation of our U of M legislative requests. Legislative briefing materials will be developed as needed by government relations for hearings or legislator inquiries, which usually happen uh, nonstop every week. <laughs> Uh, GovRel will provide guidance and review any presentation materials and leave behinds to elected officials on behalf of the university. GovRel has also been working on state and federal elected official engagement guidelines for the university community. These guidelines will ensure we comply with legal requirements, enhance our effectiveness with government contacts, and facilitate coordination and communication within the university. We plan to establish notification procedures uh, to coordinate activities, track government engagements, and provide support. The goal in this is to help align all of the university's priorities, and we'll seek your, your input and support on that. 
Next slide, please. As you look at our engagement timeline, uh, you will see that the deployment of this guidance is expected by early guidance to be early next year to be ready for the legislative 2024 session. We'll provide you with a session preview discussion internally to get regions and senior leaders on board with the strategy and the expectation of the level of government relations support that you will receive so we can coordinate on tactics throughout the session. I look forward to working with each and every one of you this legislative session. While I've said I can't guarantee we will get 100% of our request, uh, I wish I could, but I will guarantee that our presence at the Capitol will be noticeable and valuable, and that we will showcase the need for our state partnership and investment to fulfill our land grant mission. And it's not just for the state of Minnesota, it's to enhance our rankings as well beyond our state boundaries because it benefits not just Minnesota, it benefits our entire nation and the world. And I stand for you for any questions you may have, and I'm sure you'll have some. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any questions, comments? Agent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks. I would echo everyone's comments from the previous uh, part of the meeting, um, uh, expressing thanks and appreciation for this work. Um, a few different things I I've been thinking about. I'm um, glad Regent Kenyanya talked about our kind of shared history in some of the student advocacy work. I think, um, you know, knowing that the student government here on the Twin Cities campus actually has a government relations team. Um, plus, I don't know what the system campus like infrastructures look like in terms of, um, you know, considered who they would consider to be staff members on the individual student governance teams. But I think um, those functions and and our government relations function as a history of working, I think, very closely together, not saying that there's necessarily 100 uh, percent lockstep same agendas, because I think it would be naive to think that different stakeholders you know, always are going to have the same agenda. But I think we've worked very complementary with one another, and I love that that's on your radar to continue to foster that. Um, second thing um, that stuck out to me was when you talked about testimony and diversity of testimony. I think that's an opportunity for us. Um, I always want the budget person to be in the room to be able to answer questions about the budget. And I think it's great when interim president Ettinger is in the room as well. But I think we have an opportunity to um, feature different kinds of folks from the university more in testimony um, that I often see, you know, Minnesota State or others doing. Um, that I think we have opportunities there, and I'm glad to hear that's on your radar. Um, next thing is from more related to the slides that you just went through around region engagement. Um, it's something that had always surprised me since joining this board was being so rarely asked about my relationships with um, legislators or other people, and I think that's changed noticeably in the last several months. Um, and so I want to thank you for that and um, look forward to continuing to work um, collaboratively in that area. Um, and then I think the other thing sort of related to the student government comment, but even zooming out, um, understanding that there's, I think, still the Minnesota 201 group with the UMAA. Um, I've, all, I've sometimes in the past had a hard time understanding like what Minnesota 201 is doing and that the, yeah, that the Alumni Association has someone doing government relations and we do. And it seems like it's been a little bit hard to understand in the past and just in terms of what the overall vision is. Again, I think we're seeing, um, we're seeing the page turn on a lot of that and just, you know, all of what we just talked about has collaboration stamped over it. Um, but some, that's, I think, an opportunity for us as well to, to continue to zero in. And at least maybe it's just me that hasn't been clear on that in the past. But um, I think that's a, that would be helpful as we go into this next session as well. Um, I think that's it. I'll follow up if I remember the other thing. But I think that's it for now. Thank you. Do you have any responsible? And I would say thank you again. Thank you, Chair uh, Taurabe and Regent Frenchworth, uh, you all have really deep connections. You're doing this job. You went through a, a campaign. You went to the legislature and you got appointed to be on this board of regions for, for a reason. And we would assume that reason is you want to help the university. And that you're doing this because you either are curious or you already are having ideas. And we want to make sure that we align those ideas and that energy uh, for our shared purpose and our shared um, uh, priorities that you all have voted on. So I, I say um, we have to use every piece of uh, 
advocate, every advocate who's willing to show up. And showing up does make a difference, as was mentioned by interim President Enninger. Having the regions at the Capitol in those hearings says we care and we're taking the time. People notice. Um, there's been a vacuum before. We're, we can't hide that. But we're going to move forward with some more activation of not just our regions, but also um, key leaders of our community who um, share our vision, whether it's on the academic health side, which we'll learn more and, and press forward with that, but also on, on our budget requests and also on our bonding requests. Uh, there's been lack of investment in higher education. We, we don't we know that's a, a challenge and the budget forecast is not um, you know, super positive, but certainly um, makes it challenging to push ahead with what we're asking for. But we have to make the case and we can only do that is if we are on the same page and what that case looks like and why we need these resources and why the partnership with the state is so important. So uh, I want to say thank you for you all um, re you know, representing the university in these levels. Um, you also get to hear different um, uh, perspectives from different audiences that are also very influential in how we move forward. Uh, so I want this to be an open line of communication. I, we've done this before, whether it's a, a, a quick phone call, email, and we will certainly work with a board office to make sure you have what you need uh, to put your best foot forward on behalf of the university. You can't do that alone. I can't do this alone. Uh, so we're definitely going to be working in partnership. And I also want to say thank you to uh, a partner of, of mine, which has been Chuck Tomberg with uh, Public Relations. We've been working really hard, really closely. Uh, and it's just perfect because we are both working in the same environment. And sometimes it might be more political, sometimes it might be more uh, internal, but it, it's it's all things that we want to be on the same page. We have the right information. We have the same information. So we're able to to, to share that same narrative. It's important. So thank you for, for taking the time and the interest in, in this subject matter. And I look forward again to working with all of you. Thank you. Yeah, I um, I really appreciate the um, those comments about sort of diversity of voices because we have so many people who want to tell the story about the university and I think just being able to make sure that we have the expert but we also have other voices who, who you know who are impacted by by the, um, the university too. The one thing that I did want to pull out and I'm really glad to hear you pointed out in your presentation is really about coordination within the university system itself um, because I know that there has been a lot of of um, people who care so much about uh, doing advocacy well. And I think, um, you know, having you here and making sure that you're a resource for the whole uh, system to be able to uh, coordinate that. Um, and then I think um, I, I always forget that compliance part. <laughs> you know, we all want to be good advocates. And then sometimes we forget that, oh, OK, as an institution, we also have to kind of note what, what it is that we're doing overall um, in the uh, lobbying advocacy kind of space. So I appreciate that. And I hope that uh, all of our university uh, systems Systems also know that you know we'd like to see more coordination so that there can be more cohesion across the, the system to be able to do our very best to amplify uh, our messages around that so um, thank you for leading that and doing that uh, Regent Kanyanya yeah thank you Madam Chair um, <laughs> Director Lopez Franzen you know I I think we're all excited to go out and advocate. It's, it's a lot less intimidating now that you're on this side and not that side. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, looking forward to getting out there. I, you know, the coordination piece and compliance piece is really important. And I think that has to be the basis we start with, but then beyond there, you know, have a broad tent and, and, and invite everyone. And for good reason, you know, we have, I'd say, probably been concerned about how our messages might differ, and as Regent Farns will point out, they just will. But I, the overlap is probably a lot much higher, right? I mean, the core message is, is, is obviously the same, but of course we'll differ if it's students, any individual, you know, given regent, you know, um, uh, faculty, senate, you know, may have different priorities, uh, UEA student government. But the core is really the same, and I think we're, we probably have more to gain on embracing on that part, um, you know. Furthermore, you know, I feel like we all have different ears at the Capitol, right? Like you, we're going to be able to reach different audiences that you know the administration certainly can, but maybe not in the same way. Um, 
you know, faculty on just about any given topic at the Capitol have the relevant expertise, you know, um, so they should be there <coughs> testifying and providing that. Students have their priorities, the legislators, you know, uh, 201 of them come from all over the state, so we need people from all over the state uh, to meet with their requisite um, legislators. So I think that coordination piece, I mean, okay, even if student government, okay, I know on there's five priorities, we agree on four of them, we don't know about that fifth one, they're still going to go, but let's just have that relationship where I know you're going, I'm tracking what's happening there. Um, and whatnot, and, and, and same goes same goes for regions. And I think what I've found, just, I mean, that availability goes a long way in just being there and having them speak to you, you know, because I think a lot of things can be solved in a conversation. So this kind of framework we're discussing, I, I certainly in favor of it as, as my colleagues are. And I think we, I think we probably just agree on way more than we disagree. In, have to embrace that part. Thank you. Mr. Tombard. Thank you, Chair Talyarabi. I just wanted to add a note, uh, uh, kind of back at you, Ms. Lopez Franzen, uh, <laughs> in terms of our great partnership that's developing between our teams uh, and in close coordination uh, with Ms. Lopez Franzen and, and with support from Interim President Ettinger. Um, we have been able to shift some of our own existing internal resources uh, to put toward a dedicated public relations person that will support government and federal relations <coughs> entirely. Um, and that position is posted, uh, and we hope to be going into the new year with that new hire on our team as well, working very closely between the teams. It helps that we're located in the same suite in Morrill <laughs> Hall, so that, that collaboration is also happening very naturally. Regent Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair and um, Executive Director, and thank you. Uh, I think everybody has lauded your work, uh, and and I agree with that. I think uh, so. But my question is, um, the mechanics with regard to, uh, you know, who goes and chats with the legislature. Uh, when Regent Gully and I were going through, they they were like, yeah, we see you guys once when you're running for Regent, and we never see you again. And I think the group that went through last year is all, you know, ready and waiting to go, but we won't all want to be reading from the same hymnal. And, you know, from my perspective, I can, I can talk to issues uh, from northeastern Minnesota and some of the Native American issues we may run into. But, um, and, and I occasionally, I just got asked point blank by a legislator, what do you think of this figure for the University of Minnesota? And um, I, I, I deferred to, I said, you, you need to go talk to the, the correct people. And uh, anyway, but um, how would you see this working if we're going to be more engaged? Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Tao Rabe and Regent Johnson. Uh, I, I also want to say thank you for engaging our office and in in individual cases when you have something in your district because you all represent different geographic areas of our state and partnering with us uh, on response and partnering with uh, with us on, on getting uh, appropriate um, information before we respond uh, because I'm not an expert as well and all and everything that goes in the university there's a lot of people involved there's people going to the Capitol all the time um, just last week we had um, the school of public health spent pretty much an entire Friday last last Friday, uh, presenting and did a wonderful job. Uh, we had our staff, Christine Keel, who just started last week, uh, staff it in case something else comes up. Because now when you're there, you represent the university and you're going to be asked on uh, everything or anything. We, we I know that uh, IP editor just w had that experience when we had the October 30th uh, meeting and hearing. You will be asked on things above and beyond uh, your scope of expertise or your scope of information. And it's okay to say, I'll get back to you. It's okay to say, let me connect you with the right person. And we will help you with that because that's our job. Uh, we also need to make sure that um, when you go there, you don't feel like, oh my God, I forgot to uh, connect with government relations. Um, you are your own agent, you are a person, but we would like to be able to, to say that we are in partnership when you are there on behalf of the university to help you prep for that. So you can do a better job uh, with the latest information because information changes 
daily, if not by by the hour, uh, on an issue and on a decision. And some so so those things are always happening. Those dynamics. Uh, but we will set more coordination. We haven't really identified whether it's in a form of an email communication to you on a weekly basis uh, about what session looks like, what's happening, or whether it's a one-on-one -on -one ability to do some training right before you're going on air or right before you're going on a, a hearing. Uh, hearings we normally take more, have more time to prepare for, um, sometimes not so much, but we certainly can triage those situations as they, they happen. Uh, but we have a public relations team who, if you have immediate inquiry re related to legislation, uh, this person who's coming on board will be the person you want to connect with before you hop on the phone call with a, a reporter on a legislative issue, just because they will have the latest information to support you, again, with coordination uh, with the board office to make sure that we are all aware. Uh, it's not to censor and it's not to um, tell you what to say. It's to give you the tactics and the message that we think would be more appropriate for that situation. Uh, and then, as I say, you are your own agent. You represent different constituencies, and, and you went through this process. Uh, but we want to do our part of the job to be able to, to give you the knowledge we think would be helpful in those situations. And, and we'll work with public relations. We'll work, work with the board office of what that looks like uh, moving forward, because there has been some um, methods have been tried in the past. And I certainly want to be respectful of what's worked in the past, but what hasn't, and if there's a gap, we will try things new to make sure um, you're, you're equipped and, and not that you're not, but that you have um, the government relations um, memo on the issue that you're going to be asked about or that you have, um, you know, the, the, the internal um, Q&A that we, we use for responding to media uh, because those are tools we already have. So we want to make sure you, you have them at your disposal um, as, as needed. And, and certainly when you don't know, again, uh, it's okay to say, uh, you need time to respond. You don't need it to, to take that um, testimony. You don't need you don't need to testify. We have faculty that are asked to testify all the time, and they don't have to as part of their job. But when they do, on behalf of the university, uh, we like to work with the colleges. We like to work with the deans and the chancellors in our different campuses to support them um, from GovRel. But they also have their own support in, in in their own campuses. So so we work closely with them on, as well with that. So it will look differently on case by case, but we will also have. Um, if you will, a, to, a toolkit, if you will, of how we're going to deploy uh, before session. So you guys have the latest and greatest, and then we'll manage accordingly. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. We'll take two last uh, comments, and then we'll need to move on. So Regent Farnsworth? You can take me on. Oh, are you good? Sure. OK. Regent Gulley? Uh, most of what I wanted to say has already been said very well by other um, regents, but I just wanted to uh, lift up how important I think it is to have um, great relationships with different student groups and um, and faculty from the different colleges and from the different campuses who can come and lift up the things that are happening um, in different places on the university. And I think you're this is an enormous step forward on on that effort. And so thank you, and just want to encourage us to keep keep doing it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, you Miss uh, Lopez Franson. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, our third and final item is an overview of marketing efforts related to the recruitment and enrollment across the system. With us today, our interim executive director, Haida Poltico, um, Chief Marketing Officer Aronson, Executive Director Rysik. Associate Vice Chancellor Eagle and Vice Chancellor Burt, uh, Interim um, Executive Vice Chancellor uh, Heidepold. Uh, why don't we have all the speakers? Are we having all the speakers come up first? <laughs> and then. Thank you for being here. Um, we'll start with Interim Executive Vice Chancellor Heide Paul. The floor is yours. Do we have our Zoom? Okay. Good morning, and thank you, Chair Taliarabe and members of the committee. We're grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today about enrollment management, marketing, and communications. 
I'm Amy Haitapelto, and I serve as Interim Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at our Duluth campus, and I'm also the co-chair of the System Enrollment Council. Presenting with me, some by Zoom, are my colleagues Ann Aronson, Chief Marketing Officer, University Relations, Twin Cities Campus, and she's joining us via Zoom. Carrie Rysick, Executive Director, Office of Admissions, Twin Cities Campus. Trevor Eagle, Associate Vice Chancellor, Enrollment Management, Duluth Campus. Melissa Burt, Vice Chancellor for Enrollment Management, Institutional Effectiveness, Morris Campus, also joining us by Zoom. And I also want to recognize Tanya Wright, Director of Customer Experience and Communications in the Office of Admissions at the Twin Cities, who contributed to this presentation and is assisting us to stay on track this morning. Thank you, Tanya. To share a brief background of the System Enrollment Council, we officially formed in 2016 to increase collaboration of recruitment efforts across all five campuses. Our membership includes campus enrollment officers and admissions and student success leaders from all of the campuses. An executive committee comprises the vice chancellors of academic affairs and the vice provost and dean of undergraduate education from the Twin Cities. We meet monthly to discuss and advance key strategic priorities on behalf of the system. The team assembled around me is going to discuss enrollment marketing through the lens of this enrollment funnel. And then later on, our campus leaders will highlight some of the specific tactics they utilize as well as highlighting strengths, challenges, and opportunities. The key takeaway for this slide is that enrollment marketing efforts are designed to encourage very specific steps through the admissions process and the communications continue to become more and more personalized as students progress toward eventual enrollment. These efforts begin at the top with reputational brand marketing. This is designed to influence market perception of the University of Minnesota and highlight the positive attributes of the academic quality, research, and outreach mission of the overall institution. I will now turn it over to Ann Aronson, Chief, of, Chief Marketing Officer, University Relations, to share more details and introduce the system-wide marketing strategy that supports enrollment. And Ann is going to join us via Zoom. Ann. Thanks, Amy. As Amy mentioned, at the top of the funnel are the University of Minnesota Systems reputational brand campaigns, as well as campus reputational efforts. We run these campaigns to demonstrate the value we bring to Minnesota and the world. Our messages help the public understand the benefits we bring to them. I presented our current system reputational campaign, Dear Minnesota, to you back in September. In 2019, we collaborated with our campus enrollment and marketing partners to develop a marketing strategy to increase undergraduate enrollment system-wide. We ran two system-wide recruitment marketing campaigns in 2020-21 and in 2022-23. We did not run one in 2021-22 due to budget constraints. The campaigns ran in Minnesota, Wisconsin, North and South Dakota. The target audiences were seniors in the fall and juniors in the spring. The campaign messages focused on the university as a system of campuses, as well as the unique offerings of each campus, so students could find their best fit. The campaigns were exclusively digital. They used video and banner ads, as well as paid search to get our messages across. The objectives for the 2020-21 campaign were, were to increase awareness of the University of Minnesota as a system and each of the five campuses, to drive traffic to campus websites, to drive applications from high school seniors in the fall and inquiries from high school juniors in the spring. And additionally, this was during COVID and we needed to keep the university relevant and desirable to prospective students. The 2020-21 campaign theme was Discover the University of Minnesota for You, which suggests that one of our campuses will be your best fit. Here are some of the digital ads and elements we use to communicate a system message, as well as customized messages for each <laughs> campus. Yes, you might notice a familiar face in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> 
Regent Farnsworth was indeed a featured student in our campaign that year. We attribute our success to his presence. <laughs> First year campaign results were very positive. Remember, the primary objective was to drive traffic to our application and admissions pages as an augment to campus level marketing efforts. That traffic was up 10% <coughs> from 2019. The campaign resulted in over 770,000 clicks to the five campus admission sites and the system recruitment site. <coughs> Most notably, paid search was the top provider of site traffic. It also resulted in 4,300 application starts. After the campaign, 87% of juniors and seniors poll were aware that we have five campuses. I said paid search was the top provider of our site traffic. I want to make sure that everyone understands what this means. Paid search is a digital marketing strategy where we pay to get our ads placed higher on relevant search engine results pages. The goal is to drive traffic to our sites. Here's an example of what paid search looks like. Suppose someone searched for snow removal services in Minneapolis, something some of us have prob probably already done this year. You can see that Powell and Sons snow removal ad comes up first on the results page. This is because they paid for that to happen. In the same way, if a prospective student searches for colleges in Minnesota, or top colleges in the Midwest, our ads will come up first because we paid for it. The 2022-23 campaign objective was again to drive awareness and traffic. The difference this time was that we focused on the Crookston, Duluth, and Morris campuses where the greatest enrollment needs were. We focused on high school seniors and juniors as in the previous campaign. Results were very positive again. Traffic to the application and admission pages across the three campuses was up 34% from 2020. System-wide and campus level efforts drove this traffic. This resulted in over 473,000 clicks to the three campus admission sites and the system site. Once again, paid search was the top provider of the site traffic and it resulted in 833 application starts. You can see here how we have funded these efforts so far. The first year we invested $1 million funded from university relations, which drew on reputational marketing funds we didn't use that year. Year two, we invested 500,000, which was funded by the university foundation. This spring, we will receive $300,000 funded from institutional balances in a strategic investment pool. This will be invested solely in a system-wide paid search campaign to build on the success of this strategy as the top provider of site traffic. We recommend continued investment in paid search marketing beyond the spring. We estimate a per year cost of between 500,000 and 1 million. This future investment will be considered and prioritized against other critical funding opportunities as part of the university's fiscal 25 budget development process, and if included by interim president, President Ettinger in the president's recommended fiscal 25 operating budget, it will be presented to the Board of Regents for review and action in May, June of 2024. And now Carrie will talk about the fundamentals of marketing communications as part of enrolling a class. Thank you, Anne. A student's decision of where and if to attend a university is complex and multifaceted. We very deliberately build our work on, around the four P's of marketing, messaging, and considerations. First, product. We share examples and provide ways for students to experience our great academics and how they'll build community on campus. Two, price. We share information about the value of a University of Minnesota degree and how it can help propel each student in their respective careers for a lifetime of opportunities. We also highlight the various scholarships and programs like You Promise, and now the new North Star Promise and American Indian Scholars programs. Three, place. 
We share how our various campuses provide excellent educational opportunities, be it our world-class facilities and faculty, our locations with surrounding industry opportunities like internships and mentors. For promotion, we use, we all use multi-channel communication methods and recruitment team structures to promote what our campuses have to offer. And we'll talk more closely about that later on. All of these elements are woven throughout the steps of the funnel, which we'll talk about next. We've heard from university relations how their important work in the areas of branding and reputation management supports the university's overall enrollment health. Now we'd like to talk a little bit more about how we build our admissions teams and that foundation in order to meet the university's enrollment targets. The enrollment funnel anchors our communications and recruitment work. As we move from reputation building into the admission stages, we work to build a targeted group of students likely to be interested in going to college and likely to be successful in college. Our marketing and communications efforts strive to engage the student. We build this by developing and relationships and deeper awareness and interest in our campuses so that we are on their list of schools to apply for admission. If they're not considering our campuses, they won't spend the time to apply. The commitment stage is critically important. That's where we collaborate with colleges, departments, financial aid, and others to deeply personalize our messaging to students. We want them to see themselves as students thriving on our campuses. That commitment, communication, and recruitment work continues throughout the summer after a student confirms where they will attend. We work with campus partners like orientation and transition experiences and each college to help students stay excited about the university and help them transition from being a high school student to a college student. One additional note here is that throughout the stages of the enrollment funnel, we are communicating with students as well as with families and their supporters. Now I'll hand it off to my colleague Trevor from the Duluth campus. Thank you, Carrie. The key takeaway for this visual representation is that marketing and communications work best as part of a comprehensive recruitment strategy. Each activity, event, and engagement have a specific purpose and message. We simultaneously target recruitment <coughs> efforts to high school sophomores, juniors and seniors, plus their families, and their high school counselors to provide key information in the format they want when they want it. To achieve success, each campus uses a broad array of mass communication channels. As mentioned earlier, our messaging focuses on our product, exceptional academics and unique opportunities. We also focus on value, demonstrating to students how they will benefit from a University of Minnesota degree. These core messages are coupled with details about orientation, housing, financial aid, and specific college and major information as students get closer to eventual enrollment. As these communications become more specific about the college experience, it helps students and families get a taste of what it's like to be a U of M student. Repetition with prospective students and families is a critical component of enrollment marketing. These data points illustrate the volume of a multi-layered strategy across the main channels for all of our campuses combined annually. As you can see, we invest a great deal of time into these <coughs> efforts. Now I'll pass it to my colleague, Melissa, from the Morris campus. Thanks, Trevor. While marketing communications are a fundamental part of the enrollment process, it's important to also remember that they are only one component of an overarching business plan and communication strategy. Effective strategic communication is used in combination with one-on-one -on -one relationship building, specialized events, campus visits, need-based and merit-based scholarships, extra mile customer service, and high school counselor and parent work. Note too that campus marketing and communication efforts do not end once a student enrolls. All of our campuses continue to build upon the found, this foundation by marketing and intentionally communicating to continuing students and alumni. We will now share several of the enrollment strengths, 
challenges and enhancement opportunities for each of our five campuses, starting with Crookston. I'm honored to represent the Crookston campus this morning. Crookston's clearly defined strengths are its rich identity around agriculture programs and online degree offerings. The campus has also created a cohesive and integrated social media, web, and ad design presence in order to effectively communicate the benefits of a Crookston degree to prospective students and families. Those efforts, along with a well-designed recruitment strategy, have led to recent success for the Crookston campus. Campus challenges include brand awareness beyond the immediate geographic region, as well as a limited scholarship budget, which hampers the campus's ability to attract students less familiar with the university. Another challenge is declining demographics in the region, and in particular, college-going rates for male students who have historically been attracted to programs in agriculture and natural resources. Lastly, due to limited staffing, the Office of Admissions is currently outsourcing some aspects of their marketing efforts that would ideally be conducted in-house. A few items would enhance Crookston's enrollment efforts. An internal marketing specialist would allow the campus to be more nimble in its digital marketing efforts, which is particularly important for the recruitment of their online population. Additional analysis of the effectiveness of campus communication strategies would help better identify strengths and areas of opportunity. Finally, an expansion of the campus's online recruitment efforts would support outreach to prospective out-of-state students. Now, I'll pass it back to Trevor to discuss the Duluth campus. Thank you, Melissa. At Duluth, we have a lot of energy right now around advancing our enrollment marketing and communication efforts. 18 months ago, we transitioned all of the enrollment communication staff, including from admissions, into a separate unit, Enrollment Management Marketing and Communications. As a regional comprehensive that has nearly half of our admits overlapped with a large public flagship, we sit in a market space that includes competition from enrollment offices, both similar and those that are also more resourced. As such, we are laying the foundation to become more sophisticated in our marketing and communication engagements. As a campus, we have many differing strengths that we emphasize, including our location next to the shores of beautiful Lake Superior, our devotion to the undergraduate experience, a research portfolio that is unmatched in the Midwest and a national leader among regionals. All combined, we are just the right size for our faculty to work intensively with students. Regarding tactics, our UMPR office presently leads our digital awareness campaigns, which help drive traffic to our websites to support applications and visits. This same group is also advancing an institution-wide brand refresh, and we see a lot of potential how this will elevate our market perception even more. Price sensitivity is apparent in our regional peer set. And beyond the work we're initiating to better leverage tuition, discounting, and scholarships, we are also trying to break into new markets, particularly to support our in-state tuition pricing that now extends to 11 Midwest states. As a result, we see a natural opportunity to expand the system enrollment campaigns to reach these states to support brand awareness and top of the funnel activity that would align with extending our campus prospect strategy beyond our traditional and immediate four state region. As you've heard from my colleagues, enrollment marketing gets more and more personalized as students and families advance through the funnel. It is our goal to expand engagements with current students to have them share their experiences at Duluth to ultimately help prospective students like them make the decision for joining our campus family. As such, the bulk of our work is building out additional digital marketing and email communications segmented by specific audience groups to ensure we are delivering a personalized Marcom strategy versus a one-size-fits-all approach. Now, I'll hand it back to Melissa to discuss the Morris campus. 
UMN Morris faculty and students are able to develop strong relationships in our small residential <laughs> undergraduate environment, working closely in and outside of classes in mentoring and advising relationships, as well as during enrichment opportunities, such as funded undergraduate research projects, and even while studying abroad. These relationships foster excellent outcomes for our diverse population, including approximately 30% who go on to graduate and professional school. The campus has a strong state, national, and international reputation in sustainability, the evidence of which is easily visible across campus from our composting efforts to our many solar arrays. We started working with a new search marketing partner this fall, and they are already better amplifying our message in print through new email campaigns and in our digital ads. Their efforts build upon the updated admissions materials that we completed last fall. We have also expanded our digital ads to include influencer marketing, and we'll soon start ads to a slightly younger demographic than we have targeted in the past. I'll quickly address several of our current challenges. The first is remaining top of mind for today's students and influencers, as our reach is not as significant as some of our competitors. This is another reason why other forms of marketing, such as the system-wide marketing discussed earlier, are of such value to our campus. Next, the campus is located in a part of the state that, for many, requires an intentional visit. But when visitors do get to campus, they often rave about the beauty and the community feel. We also continue to strive to combat the notion that a small campus cannot provide access to the opportunities and resources of a larger institution. Morris's admissions and communications and marketing teams have also worked over the last two years to better elevate the distinctiveness of our campus. And we continue efforts to both highlight those elements, transformative student engagement, sustainability, access to experiential learning, and keep them top of mind. Finally, there are persistent challenges in persuasively communicating the career applic applicability of a liberal arts education particularly in, particularly in today's climate. <laughs> One area of need for our campus is staffing to enhance our web and video presence. We know that families and influencers seek additional information on our website. And although we have recently undergone a web redesign, our need has increased both by the volume of work related to the continual upkeep and recent changes in personnel. And now I'll hand it back to Trevor to discuss the Rochester <coughs> campus. Thanks, Melissa. I'm grateful to represent the Rochester campus today. Rochester has tremendous strength around their identity. They know who they are and who they <coughs> serve. This translates into having a dedicated focus on preparing students for careers in healthcare. The curriculum is leading edge. It's all about applied hands-on learning experiences, both in and outside the classroom. It leverages its place and community embeddedness through its partnership with Maya. For students, this includes an option to live in a multi-use space that also has ongoing research happening. Students drawn to the personalized learning in the heart of what is colloquially known as Med City thrive at Rochester. Its new Student Life Center is a testament for how the campus is also attracting and competing for more and more students to receive a healthcare education that is unlike any other. Due to the limited number of majors, the prospects pool is much smaller, especially in comparison to the other system campuses. However, due to the demand and interest of healthcare professions, regional competition throughout Minnesota and Wisconsin is very strong. In recent years, the campus has begun shifting priorities to net tuition revenue and using scholarships to discount and build an incoming class. But to remain competitive, especially with campuses offering more traditional experiences, Rochester needs to continue expanding scholarships. The campus also has another tremendous strength. It offers in-state tuition pricing nationwide. To better capitalize on this offering, Rochester could greatly benefit from expanding its name recognition marketing and advertising its specialized offerings much more within the region and beyond. Now, I'll pass it back to Carrie to talk about the Twin Cities campus. Thank you, Trevor. The Twin Cities campus features a variety of strengths. 
from a solid academic reputation in the Midwest and in the Big Ten Conference to an excellent location that supports an array of career opportunities, especially with 15 Fortune 500 companies, a wealth of nonprofits, and many options for research and professional programs. Our 74.5% four-year graduation rate is also a major strength. We do have our share of challenges though. The biggest is increasing competition for Minnesota's top students. The Board of Regents has heard before about the declining number of high school graduates in the region. Additionally, the cost of higher education presents challenges for most families. Finally, an increasing number of high school graduates are choosing to not attend college. We see three primary opportunity areas. First, we look forward to continued support to fund and also expand outreach volume for our existing programming, especially because inflation has impacted our basic marketing and communication costs. Second, we see an opportunity for more formal outreach and programming to reach ninth graders and younger to influence their academics, future academics. Finally, while we enjoy awareness in the Big Ten and regionally, we need continued investment in national markets like California, Texas, Illinois, and New York to break through the enormous clutter in the higher education marketplace. And now Amy will share next steps. Thank you, Carrie. As we conclude our prepared remarks, we wanted to highlight some of the possibilities the System Enrollment Council has identified to continue collaborating and enhancing enrollment market. This includes reviving the enrollment communications working group within the System Enrollment Council, expanding investment in system-wide marketing campaigns, especially into expanded markets as a few of our campus leaders have just highlighted in their remarks, and continuing to advocate for collaborations and investments into the personalized marketing approaches that each campus needs to remain competitive. Thank you again, Chair Taliarabe and members of the committee. We are very grateful, our team is very grateful for your partnership and we are now eager to hear your comments, questions and suggestions. That concludes our formal presentation portion this morning and we'll open for questions. Thank you again, Chair Taliarabe. Thank you speakers for a very informative presentation. We'll turn to discussion and I think the first is Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Tower Robbie. Um, thank you for that presentation. It, it um, fills in a lot of information, knowledge gaps that I have. And um, I really think enrollment management is both an art and science. And if we look at the um, enrollment funnel on page 34, um, I get a lot of comments and it's anecdotal data only. And I don't know if it matches up with real data. Um, but it's consistent and it's um, ongoing. And it, it points me to the stage um, of inquiry. You fill the basket um, that students and it also goes right to what Trevor said about having a personalized, um, more personalization as one advances through the funnel. But it seems that I hear that that's the big disconnect in that students, um, prospective students, want to feel wanted. And that's the piece I consistently hear is missing. And it's undergraduate and both graduate levels. And so I'm wondering um, um, if, if that anecdotal information plays out data-wise, but um, it seems like some of the, the steps that you're talking about going to aim at that piece, um, but it, I just wanna say it, it, and people don't know they're talking to a regent, when they tell me this, um, and then I ask more questions, but they, that really seems so critical. And anyone who's had kids themselves looking at colleges, they know when they're wanted. And if they're not getting something from the you that speaks to them, it's like, well, they don't want me. So um, I think that's, the, that's a big challenge. I don't know if it fits in with the data you see, but that's just a comment. Thank you, Chair Talia and thank you, um, 
Regent Davenport, would any of our team like to provide some additional comments in this specific area? To Regent Davenport. Sure, I can um, add that we, of course, uh, want for students to see themselves here at the university. That is our goal, to support students throughout the enrollment funnel um, and to um, you know, have that blend of one-on-one -on -one relationship building directly with students. So our efforts are extensive and appreciate your comments as we uh, really focus on supporting students and connecting uh, with them. Thank you, Chair Tom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Regent Kanyanya. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Vice Chancellor Heights Pelto and team, thanks for the presentation and, and all the work and attention um, to this. This is really helpful information um, and again, helps us appreciate just the complexity. You know, I mean, it, it's hard, <laughs> it's a, you know, um, and, and all the kind of cat and mouse, you know, that, that you all are playing. Um, you know, I, I feel like the, the system enrollment group is really important um, you know, and I'm glad it's continuing, you know, because there's year after year, the campuses, the chancellors, you know, come and report what they're doing, and that's important, but there has to be this system outlook uh, that, that's, that's ongoing, so I'm glad that that group is um, continuing strong and thinking about these things, and, you know, maybe it might even, it, it might even be appropriate at some point to consider a dedicated full-time you know system enrollment person who's really looking at all the different actions we're doing and what because the council meets but you know you can't dedicate all your time to that so a um, couple thoughts and questions if I can decipher my own notes here um, I so on the the funnel back to the funnel that Regent Davenport was <laughs> talking about I think there was a comment that we're targeting students that are likely to go to college and likely to succeed. I was curious how we're, I guess, just what kind of factors we're, we're using to, to determine um, you know, who gets that marketing, specifically to those comments. Sure. We, um, you know, an effective, you know, communication strategy really blends that strategic communication with that one-on-one -on -one relationship building. Uh, we uh, work to really um, saturate the market and reach as many students as possible in our recruitment outreach. We do work with a, um, a, a vendor partner to really leverage that partnership and, and enrollment growth. Our direct marketing vendor partnerships have allowed us to really develop and expand that outreach uh, in working with prospective students. So we're, we're looking at um, you know, developing those pipelines and reaching as many students as possible um, in our outreach for prospective students. Yeah, yes. thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank, or, I think the uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. thank you, thank you, Chair Talurabe, and and thank you, Regent Kenyanya. The, your first part of it, you almost asked a question and made a comment. So I just wanted to respond <laughs> a little bit to that. So just just for just for the group, centralized or more centralization of enrollment marketing has been discussed at various times. The System Enrollment Council currently serves an informal integrating function across all of the campuses in the absence of any other formal linkage mechanism. And it might, it might be beneficial to have a, a different kind of structure. Opinions vary, and I'm sure this is going to be an ongoing discussion in future meetings. Some functions can't easily be centralized. For example, the sources that sell names to colleges and universities do not allow those names to be shared between multiple campuses. But other functions work really well in a collaborative space, such as our shared presence at the Minneapolis National College um, Fair, where all five campuses interact with all prospective students together, or with annual meetings that we hold for high school counselors, where schools can hear from the directors of admission at all five campuses. So obviously, there's an opportunity to think about things differently and perhaps think about what the future might look like. But I did want to say that that this does work as a as a coordination and linking mechanism and allow the the five campuses to coordinate very well together. And that I think was your first question. Yeah, yeah, briefly. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Vice Chancellor, for the for the answer. So on um, that answered my comment. <laughs> my oh, comment, your comment. Question, <laughs> My comment question. So thank you. Um, back to the, the other point, and I and uh, it sounds like you said there's a vendor involved, so maybe 
might need a little more clarity. Sure. I, I was just making sure, um, you know, when we say likely to go to college, um, history kind of tells us certain groups are likely to go to college, and I, I want to make sure, whether it's us or the vendor, we're not then using that same data to, to, to market to you know, certain groups. And I'm not saying that's happening, but um, that that's what I was getting at. And then a comment, um, I've had some um, discussion. I think I was speaking with Regent Hibbs uh, some time back and some others um, about how we can, and I don't know how, but I'm putting out there how we can leverage um, ourselves, our alumni, our, the whole university community for um, recruitment, really, and allow, you know, deputize, you know, us to go back to our communities, wherever that is, whether it's a geographic community or some other kind of community, and, and kind of represent the university that, you know, that we all care about. And again, I'm not just talking about specific regions. I'm talking about all the people who went here and are glad they did and, and are kind of ready to spread that gospel to, to the young folks they know. And I don't know what mechanism there is for that, but I'd love to see us think more about folks like that. Yeah. But thank you, thank you for the work. Yeah. Thank you, Regent Kenyanya. Just in the time of interest, I think I'll move on to Regent Johnson. Oh, thanks. I'll be, try to be quick because I know we're over time now. Um, but um, having grown up in the Duluth area I, um, and chatting with my friends, uh, their, their comment is usually if you go one state over, uh, it, parents of, of kids going to school, they, they, have, they have this idea that uh, it's cheaper to go someplace else. Uh, and then when I was at UMD on a, on a you know, kind of interviewing kids as to why they came there, they said, well, it's part of the University of Minnesota, which is one of the great universities in the world. So that seems to be the yin and the yang of, of <laughs> uh, and that's, I guess, your challenge, I guess, is to, you know, cheaper is not necessarily better. And, um, uh, and I don't know how you convince them that the U of M is, is every, every branch is a, is a value for Minnesotans. Thank you, Chair Talia Rabe and, and Regent Johnson. I think that perhaps Trevor Eagle might like to offer some comments on the work that, that UMD is doing in this area. Thank you, Madam Chair. Regent Johnson, you heard me talk a little bit about uh, tuition discounting and scholarshiping. And so it has been a fact that uh, students leaving Minnesota have been able to find a more affordable public higher education experience outside our borders. But we as a system, you heard me talk about it at the Rochester campus, and you heard me talk about initiating it particularly at Duluth. And so we as a system are, are taking measures to spread that across all of our campuses in particular to be able to, to leverage, obviously, the, the five strong campuses, one University of Minnesota world-class degree, literally lean into that. But at the same time, we use this as a enrollment management strategy and tactic that we know that we need to be more competitive and we've done some analysis particularly at our campus at Duluth and we might be missing out on some students because we weren't able to provide small discounts that would have moved the needle for them to be able to say I want to invest in that higher quality education at the University of Minnesota and so we're, we're taking steps to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair. I'll go really quick. Um, a couple things. One, I uh, want to say thanks as well. I think these types of conversations um, are the power of why we created the special committee to be able to really dig into this stuff. So thank you um, to committee leadership and everyone who made this possible. Um, would echo Regent Kenyanya's thoughts about uh, the, you know, this is a clear demonstration of the import importance of the System Enrollment Council, um, all this work that was on display today. and potential future opportunities. Uh, a little bit based on some previous conversation, um, but you know, trying to figure out uh, when we get to our budget conversations in May and June, how to translate uh, a lot of these recommendations or some or you know, somewhere in between um, into tangible investments into the budgets. I know for as long as I've been on the board, which I guess is the same time as Region Hips, Region Hips always talks about I'm investing in marketing. 
Um, and so I guess that, um, no pressure to interim President Ettinger um, in the President's <laughs> recommended budget, but I know you share these values and, and believe this is important too. And so I'm hoping in those conversations um, in May and June, we're able to see, you know, we talked about this, here it is appearing in the budget um, and in all of that. And I guess the last, I'd be remiss not to um, emphasize how great the 2020-2021 um, system-wide campaign was. <laughs> um, I had not seen that before this morning. So um, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, I think that it, it turned out pretty good. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Regent uh, Farnsworth. Then. I, yeah, I particularly want to call out that slide on the budget. I think that it's important and it was interesting to me to see the fluctuation of that. So I think just um, trying to understand a little bit about in our budget um, what that might look like. And I, I take it that um, Chief Marketing Officer Aronson's point about sort of um, aspirationally what what might um, be needed um, given kind of the staff's uh, uh, ambitions and in, in the work and so thank you for providing that um, you know foresight so that we can consider um, here in this committee and also as we think about the budget I think that's really important so um, any other comments otherwise I think with that um, I will adjourn the meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Robbie. And members. Thank you. Thank you.